Welcome to the Andy Staples Show, big Friday show. We've got Lincoln Riley, the head coach of the Oklahoma Sooners. He's been the head coach four seasons. He's won four Big 12 titles. He's been to the college football playoff three times. He's doing all right there. Uh, that is the uh, the best job in the Big 12, as I decided in my argument with Ari Wasserman on Monday. Uh, some of you have disagreed with that, but I think that the more rational, sane people understand that you want to work at the place where everybody's aligned, where everybody's trying to help you in. And you know, people thought I was I was bagging on Texas and, and saying that Texas is a terrible job. It's not. It's still a really good job. It's just that there are impediments to you reaching the potential you can reach because you have an administration that does not always help. And you saw this again with the, the Eyes of Texas thing. They released the 57-page report on the history of the song. And my takeaway on that, and, and I wrote a column for The Athletic this week about it, is you play the song, but don't make anybody stand there for it. Don't suggest, as Steve Sarkeesian did, that you're going to make anybody stand there for it because there's a good reason why some people on your team don't want to stand there for it. And you can't force someone to feel the way you feel about a song. You just can't. And to his credit, Jay Hartzell, the, the president at Texas, said that they're not going to make anyone stand there. Now, he may want to pass that message along to Steve Sarkeesian, who I'm sure will be glad to hear it because I don't think he wants to talk about that with recruits. I don't think he wants recruits saying, are you going to make me sing that song? Because I guarantee you that is what coaches that recruit against Texas are, are telling them. They're saying, they're going to make you sing the song, you know. And Jay Hartzell says that's not what's going to happen. So with any luck, that will be the end of that. But that's yet another example of an issue that, that just gets in Texas's way. And I, I think if they ever find a way to stop having those types of issues, then yes, they can work toward their potential. And yes, they can be a national title contending type team. But you've got to get through that stuff first. But at least they're not Kansas. That would be the worst situation. When we talked with Matt Fortuna on Tuesday, Kansas had parted ways with Les Miles. When we recorded the episode, Jeff Long had not had his press conference yet. That press conference was, whew, it was bad. And Jeff Long, the AD, said that he would be the one to hire the next coach. Well, after that very poor performance in that press conference, he apparently was called by the chancellor and told, no, you will not be hiring the next coach. Jeff Long out as the athletic director at Kansas. He's going to get a $1.375 million parting gift on the way out the door, which is, it's nice work if you can get it. If, if you can be so incompetent that you get yourself fired in that fashion and still get that kind of money out the door, it's, it's a pretty good deal. And uh, the original sin of Jeff Long at Kansas wasn't necessarily the hiring of Les Miles. It was the firing of David Beatty and then the decision that he was going to stiff David Beatty on his buyout. And this is the one where I just questioned, what's he thinking? Why is he doing this? Is he, is he okay? Because the brilliant idea that Jeff Long had to get rid of David Beatty and not pay him was he was going to tell the NCAA that David Beatty had analyst coaching, which is against NCAA rules, but everybody in America does it. And unfortunately for Jeff Long, the staff he'd hired was doing it. And during a deposition, he was shown photos of coaches on the new Kansas staff or analysts on the new Kansas staff coaching the players and then realized, oh, the jig is up. I can't stiff David Beatty on his buyout. They, they settled. Beatty got about what he was going to get anyway. Kansas spent a bunch of money in legal fees. And oh, by the way, cherry on top of that one, which feeds into the controversy this week. When Jeff Long was asked about the other coaches he interviewed for the opening, he couldn't remember anybody's name. He said, Todd Graham or Todd Grantham? Well, Todd Graham and Todd Grantham are two different people. Todd Graham is the former Arizona State coach who now coaches Hawaii. Todd Grantham is Florida's defensive coordinator. Don't look or sound anything alike. And then he said, some guy who worked for the LA Rams. Well, that's Jed Fish, who's currently the Arizona head coach. And then he goes, I'm going to forget his name again, the, the Cincinnati Bengals defensive coordinator. That would be Lou Anarumo. How do you not remember people you interviewed a few 
months earlier for a multi-million dollar job. How do you not remember that? Because you did not want to hire them. You weren't interested in the interview. You were going to hire less miles all along. And that that's part of the problem. And probably part of the reason why Kansas did not vet less miles very well. So Jeff Long is out. We'll see who they hire as the athletic director. The chancellor says that is the person who will hire the next football coach. They're not going to go the, the Ole Miss route when they fired Pete Boone and Houston Nutt at the same time and then hired Hugh Freeze first and Ross Bjork later to be the AD. They're going to do what Tennessee did and then UCF did because Tennessee did it to them where you go AD first, then the coach. So we will see what that winds up being, but just a complete mess at Kansas and uh, I cannot believe Les Miles got almost two million bucks and Jeff Long got 1.375 million to go away. Both of them had demonstrated that they should be fired for cause. Kansas just wasted that money. But, you know, after Jeff Long's performance in that one deposition, I don't know if you want to go to court again over buyouts because that turned out very badly for Kansas last time. Although with Jeff Long on the other side of it, I think maybe it would have turned out better for Kansas. So we'll see what happens. Other news that I found very interesting this week, press release before the Big Ten basketball tournament game between Michigan State and Maryland. Michigan State's basketball team heretofore will be known as the MSU Spartans presented by Rocket Mortgage. Dan Gilbert, the the owner of Quicken Loans and Rocket Mortgage, is a a Michigan State grad, so I I, I get that part. But I just, they, they got clowned all day during the game. And uh, it was just, you know, they need points. And how much do those points lower their interest rates? And uh, very bad mortgage humor, but it's it, it's not, it's just not good. It, it, does, it sounds terrible. It doesn't roll off the tongue. I'm hoping if they do this for the football team, that they do something a little bit different, maybe go a little bit local, maybe go with the peanut barrel, home of the rodeo burger, or maybe they go to uh, to Joe's Giz- Gizzard City in nearby Potterville. They will deep fry literally anything. It's a favorite spot of the Michigan State offensive line. I think that would be a good a good sponsor. But you know the the basketball team lost, so you're not going to have any more mortgage jokes until basketball season starts next year. Though I, it got me thinking that you know we, if if they're going to do this, and look. I don't have a problem with the schools doing this as long as they make these NIL rules that are going to allow the players to do the same thing. So if you want to have the MSU Spartans presented by Rocket Mortgage, I want Michigan State's quarterback to get that Bang Energy sponsorship or whatever it is, whoever wants to sponsor the guy. So I, it, it, I'm fine with it, but it got me thinking about other other teams and football teams that, that could do the same thing. And, you know, we got to have the Alabama Crimson Tide presented by Golden Flake. I mean, Bear Bryant used to eat Golden Flake potato chips on his coach's show. This is a, a completely natural fit. Uh, Florida State, Spanx. The Florida State Seminoles presented by Spanx. Uh, Spanx founder Sarah Blakely is a proud Florida State grad. Now, there may be some issues with the Nike sponsorship, but I think, you know, listen, Spanx could definitely make the uniform pants. They, they would be, you know, very snug, the thigh pads, the the butt pads, the the knee pads would never move. Be perfect. Ball State, Worldwide Pants Incorporated. Obviously, what is Worldwide Pants? They don't make pants. It's David Letterman's production company. Of course, David Letterman, your most famous graduate of Ball State University, and then the Texas Longhorns. We talked about them earlier. Franklin Barbecue. On, on, it's not an Austin institution because it hasn't been open long enough to to be considered an institution, but it is still the best brisket on earth. And it, it works very well for the Longhorns because when you get it when, it, when it all clicks, when it's right there in front of you, when you finally get it in your mouth, it's awesome. But you have to wait and wait and wait and wait. It's a perfect sponsor. Speaking of the Longhorns and their rival in the Red River rivalry, the Oklahoma Sooners continue to do very well. Now, this was a, a year when Oklahoma won the Big 12, did not make the college football playoff. Very interesting recruiting strategy by Oklahoma this year. You, you've seen different coaches take different tacks in this in this post-COVID year where you have your super seniors coming back. Uh, you're going to have an older team. You also have potential transfers that you can take that have four years of eligibility remaining. Uh, the Sooners 
hit the mother load at Tennessee, taking a few players who were leaving Tennessee. And it looks like those guys probably will be able to contribute immediately to Oklahoma. And then added some really good high school recruits who they had targeted and said, these are our guys. And if we get them, great. And if we don't, we'll, we can pull some guys out of the portal. But they got most of what they wanted. And then they went into the portal. It's going to be a really interesting year in Norman. Year two as the starter for Spencer Rattler. I think the expectations are at least a Big 12 title. Go back to the playoff. And this time, get to the title game. Here's me and Lincoln Riley. Joined now by the head coach of the Oklahoma Sooners, Lincoln Riley. He's in his, his palatial office with a beautiful natural light. And it, it, it was interesting, Lincoln, because I, I was re-listening to your National Signing Day press conference. And, and you were talking about the difference in recruiting transfers versus recruiting high school kids. And you said, oh, the transfers aren't worried about all this facility stuff. And, and all this. You, you got this beautiful facility and now you've got all these guys that, that just want to come win football games, and that's all they're worried about. How, 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 does, how does that work? Is it, is it really that different with a, with a kid coming out of high school and a, and a guy who's maybe played at a, another Power 5 school? Oh, it's totally different. I, I, you know, and every kid individually is looking you know, for different things and has, has different priorities. But, no, it's, it's certainly you can feel that these guys have, have been through the recruiting process and they understand um, – they maybe have, a, I think at that point, just a clear picture of what they're looking for. I think a lot of times high school players, and you understand that they've never been through something like this, but don't even necessarily know what they're looking for and, and what truly right. is going to be important. And, it, you know, if you get a guy that's transferring, he's leaving somewhere for a reason. Um, and so you just, uh, you know, for us, it's been, you know, can we be, uh, can we be the group that maybe, you know, is able to, to, to fill that and be the group that can provide you know, whatever it is that they think that they that they weren't getting at another place, whether it's coaching, whether it's opportunities, play at a high level, winning championships, whatever it is. And and then if it's a fit for us, fit for them, then here we go. I, I'm curious because there's some situations that are kind of unique to this year where you can take a transfer who played last year who has four years of eligibility left. Um, I think Keyshawn Lawrence uh, from uh, from the, who you took from Tennessee is, is one of those guys. It, is that like almost like getting a high school guy who just happens to have the college experience? Yeah, no, I think it is. It's uh, there's there's certainly some benefits to it. Again, I think it's got to be the right guy and the right fit. Uh, but no, it is. I mean, a guy that's had that experience and and you know, players now have the ability to take advantage of this this COVID waiver. Um, and so, in a way, you know, for those guys that year did not even count. And you know, a guy like Keyshawn, you know, was great for us because you know we already knew the kid. You know, we we recruited. Yeah. He came on a visit here. I mean, so it was almost like, yeah, it's almost like he took a one-year hiatus and then uh, and then came back to us. So it's uh, no, it's a great situation, and you know that's that's the way of the world. I, I you get it. Um, I you know I certainly still hope that we can find a way to restrict that within the interconference. I I'd still I still think we've got to protect the game and the integrity of the game and and teams that you're playing every single year. I don't know that's going to be healthy for the game if we, all of a sudden we get a bunch of guys that aren't graduates that are, that are transferring to the conference. So I hope that's something that, you know, that we'll continue to remain firm on. Um, so we'll see how that part plays out, but uh, no, I think it's, it's a, something we've been excited about and worked out well for us this cycle. Has it changed how you handle your recruiting operation? Are, are there, do you have people who are assigned to, to kind of watch other leagues, other, other players elsewhere, who might be somebody that, that you could be interested in later. Cause it, it's a weird deal. You can't go contact them that the, they, they have to be in the portal, but once they hit the portal, you better know about them so that you, you can decide, is this someone we might be interested in or not? We do. We do. We've, we've, uh, you know, figured out that that was going to be a tool that we were going to be able to use to build our roster. Doesn't mean that we'll necessarily use it every year on a certain number of people. I think every year is different and your needs are different and what's out there is different. But I think, um, you know, I think it's, it gives us an opportunity to keep tabs on some of the guys that we've recruited, uh, just kind of, you know, loosely follow how their career goes. And then if, you know, they ever decide they want to make a change again, those are the ones that, you know, have tended to, you know, be the best for us. I mean, you look at, you know, you look at Kyler Murray, you look at, you know, Keyshawn and Wanye this year. I mean, those are examples of guys that we recruited and knew and, and 
this this wasn't just something that a spur of the moment, you know, and just hoping this works. And we don't know their personality. They don't know our personality. So um, that's uh, we certainly have people that, that are paying attention to it and uh, we'll use it as needed. I know you mentioned some of the, the guys you signed out of high school this year. The first time you, you actually met them or their parents in person was when they moved into campus. How tough is that? I mean, and, and, and then you, you mentioned Wanya and, and, and Keyshawn. You've actually met them. You've, you've met their parents. Like you're right. It, it, you had a probably a deeper recruiting process with them than with some of the high school guys you signed. Oh, absolutely. We, we, without a doubt did. We were able to go, you know, to their schools, in some cases, their homes. Uh, and I think we had two players that we signed here at midterm that we had never met. Uh, we had, I think three players that we signed that came here midterm that the day they moved in was the first time they had ever been to Oklahoma in their lives. Um, and so, wow. Yeah, it was it was amazing. It was a weird feeling. That move in day, we had an event in our weight room. It's we were lucky we got a pretty big area, so we were able to have a you know mast, you know all that all that type of event. But just to be able to see somebody or give them a hug or shake their hand almost felt wrong. It was it was weird not yeah. seeing them behind a recruiting or you know, behind a computer screen. And uh, but yeah, I, I, it was different for us, but it was definitely the most different for the recruits and families that just went through this. Because I mean, those of us that have children, it's hard to imagine. You know, sending our child. Well, that's what, I, I can't. I can't yeah. even imagine the fear of sending sending my kid to to a place I've never been. They've never been with people I've only seen on a computer screen. Absolutely, uh, it's and I think a lot of the guys that we ended up taking that were in that situation, there was there were mutual friends or people that knew us um, and and what we were about that were maybe able to to reassure them. You know, if, as far as what they were getting into. But no, you do you you appreciate their their trust and in some ways blind faith in us. You guys have used the transfer, you know, portal and even pre-portal uh, really well, where you've been able to plug guys in. But I, I was looking at your your defensive line depth this year. This is a case where you you've got a bunch of guys back. I, I'm trying to think that this is probably as deep as I remember an Oklahoma defensive line being in in recent years. How how important is that? Where where you've got guys who've kind of developed through the program, and and now here they are ready to play, ready to help you. Isaiah Thomas is a fifth year. I guess he's a fifth year junior now, yeah, but, that's right. but, that's uh, right. but that's a guy, but that's a guy who kind of worked his way through to become a really good player. How important is it to still have those guys in your program? Oh, it's that, that'll always be a part of it. I mean, it's uh it's a huge part of it. You unfortunately you don't get, you know, many guys like an Isaiah Thomas that are patient enough to, you know, maybe withstand that first couple of years where maybe I'm not playing as much or maybe it's not the Hollywood beginning to my career that I hoped it would be. Uh, so, you, 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 one, you appreciate those guys, and I, and I think they're absolutely necessary. And so, you know, for us, we don't ever want to get too far away from that. I mean, I, there's nothing that ever replaces developing a player in our program and then being built up, you know, from understanding our culture, our coaches, the way that we do things, the expectations, our standard here. Um, you know, and I, IT is a great example. Of that and that 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 as a whole has been a big key to our defensive line. I mean, we had the most productive defensive line in college football last year, and uh, from top to bottom. And you know, and and you you don't do that with just one great player here and there. You know, you do that with with like you said, quality depth and some explosive players. And so that's uh, you know that position in particular for us is a great example, and it's really become a strength of our football team. So you look at the numbers since Alex Grinch got there, and they've gotten progressively better each of the the two years he's been there. Is it is it schematic? Is it roster upgrade? Is it a mix of them? And and how how comfortable do you feel with with where you're at roster wise on defense now? Yeah, you know, it started off as as culture, and then it started off some schematic as well. Um, you know, we had to change just the mindset of our, our defensive players and what it's like to play defense at Oklahoma. Um, there have been some of the greatest defenses that have ever played this game have done it right here in Norman, Oklahoma, and there wasn't any reason in our mind why that couldn't and wouldn't happen again. And, and so, you know, was, we were able to put together a great defensive staff, had a lot of buy-in from our, our, our defensive players, especially our older guys, um, their year one, um, had some success. And then with that success comes the opportunity to recruit uh, even better talent and to upgrade your roster. So, I mean, our roster defensively looks a lot different than it did two years ago. Um, and, you know, we're just able, you know, we're not, 
having to go out and promise or sell hype right now. You know, it's not that we're going to do this, you know, some point down the road and it hasn't happened. Like the proof is there, the development yeah. of all these positions of production. And now you can walk into any, you know, not, not walk into anybody's living room right now. You can jump on a zoom call with exactly, exactly. Country and feel like, uh, you know, you've got a great product to put in front of them. Now this, I know your answer is going to be completely different than if I'd asked Bob Stoops this question 20 years ago, but what constitutes successful defense now in 2021? Yeah, it's a, I, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, as the game has changed and offenses have evolved, I, I think, you know, I think you're seeing particularly in this league that I think, I think you've got to continue to evolve defensively. I think, um, you know, I think one, just the ability to control football games, I think, I mean, I think stats still tell some of the story. I mean, without a doubt, I mean, there's still some of the top defenses in the country that are holding people down and that are, you know, creating a lot of explosive plays. Um, you know, I think yards per play is still a very, very telling stat on just how dominant that you're playing. Um, uh, and then I think, I think there's the eye test a little bit too, you know, and are you controlling football games? Are you playing dominant uh, are you playing dominant defense and able to separate from people and able to create big plays as well on the defensive side of the ball? So, uh, you know, I, I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. I, I believe a little bit the, well, you're not going to hold anybody to so however many points anymore is a little bit of a cop out. Like, I mean, I think that's, you know, yeah, offenses have changed and some of the rules, do some of the rules benefit offensive football? Yeah, they do. I mean, as offensive coach, you love it, but I mean, as a, just a, like, for example, just to somebody that appreciates football, like there's no way a lineman should be able to go three yards downfield and be able to throw a forward pass. Like that makes no sense at all. But <laughs> it's the way the rules are. It affects the game. But I, I still believe just the notion that all of a sudden, well, we can't hold anybody under this anymore. I mean, I, I don't totally believe that. I think you can still play great defense and play it at an elite level. And, you know, is it going to be six points a game? No, but I still believe – you know, you can really hold people down and dominate football games if you're good enough. So Lincoln Riley wants the uh, the yardage moved back to one for the uh, lineman downfield. The 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 pop the, that that's the headline coming out of this, right? Who knew <laughs> yeah, you and Nick Saban were on would. the same team? <laughs> yeah, I know it. I know it. That I, I, most people wouldn't believe I would think that, but that, again, that's just more from an overall perspective of just like good for the game and like just how you think the rules of football should be. I. I you know, I'd, I'd love to see it, but we'll, we'll take advantage of it as long you, as you do feel terrible for those safeties, because oh, if you yeah. see a lineman three yards down the field, you're, you're coming downhill. I mean, come on. Oh, everybody defensively. It's just it, when you sit back and think about the rules that it should not be that way. I mean, it just again, it makes it makes no sense. But that's is what it is right now. So when Alex gets there, does he ask you, "Hey, I need I need some help from you to to practice this way, or can you know can you can you give us these looks? Can you do or how, how does that conversation take place that yeah, hasn't one, evolved over the two years?" One thing, honestly, that that you know, Coach Stoop shared with me, you know, as you know, when he left this job and I got this job, was that he always believed that you know I would have a good feel for you know, what we needed offensively from a practice and preparation standpoint to be successful. And he, he encouraged me to really give, you know, whoever the defensive coordinator was, you know, a lot of leeway and, and how we practice and being able to accommodate those guys. And so that was something I shared with him as we visited about the job was that I, I was going to give him a lot of input there, was really going to listen to his input and try to, you know, tailor what we do to, to making us successful defensively. And, and I, you know, I feel like we've done that. Um, that's uh, I think offensively we've been able to work around anything that we need to defensively and, and 95% of the time we can find something that certainly satisfies both needs. So, uh, but yeah, I give him a ton of input, our defensive staff, a ton of input. And, you know, if we ever get one of those where it kind of comes down that defense would rather do this and offense would rather do this, then, then we do what the defense wants to do. Uh, well, and, and the offense usually on Saturdays does what it wants to do. But I, I wanted to ask you about uh, Spencer's development, particularly Spencer Rattler, your quarterback. Uh, it, it felt just from watching from afar that, that there was sort of a light that flipped on after he was taken out of the, the Texas game and then put back in. And, and it, he just seemed like a different guy after that. It, did Was there something else behind the scenes or, or did did we actually see that? 
Well, I think it was a, I mean, that game obviously is always a big game and, and it was an important moment. And I think, um, you know, it kind of, his back was against the wall there a little bit, so to say. And, and uh, you know, I think just the way, I think the way he responded and played after that was, I think, just a boost of confidence uh, to do it, you know, in that environment when things haven't gone your way against a good opponent, um, you know, to rally and play the way he did, I think certainly boosted his confidence. And, and I think just the confidence of our unit as a whole, um, you know, he had some really, he had some, honestly, some, he actually played better before that game than people probably remember. He played very well the first week. Um, you know, he was, he was really good for the first three quarters of the Kansas state week. And then we, as a team really, you know, fell apart and play very good there. He honestly played other than the last play of the game, played lights out against us, the, against Iowa state the very first time we, I think dropped three touchdown passes, did not play very well around him. But he he had he had played pretty well, but obviously we as a team weren't playing the way we wanted to, and offensively we weren't. And the quarterback's gonna, you know, carry some of the brunt of that. That's just the, the nature of the business. And uh, but I think the Texas win, uh, you know, just gave him an added boost of confidence and and uh, you know, so was it an important moment because of his confidence? I think it was. Um, that game is always a, can be a pivotal moment um, in a season. Um, but, you know, he was he was doing some pretty good things before that as well. How different was that for you? Because I mean, Baker had played at Texas Tech and, and then sat for a year in the program. And uh, Kyler had played at A&M and, and then Baker's back up. Uh, and then Jalen had played three years at Alabama. And here's Spencer. He's, he's redshirted, but he's never – really gotten to do this before yeah I was uh I mean I think it just made my focus as far as preparing him a little bit different you know whereas those other guys you didn't have to I say you didn't worry about it. I mean you're always trying to improve everything but you knew they had played and been in those situations so maybe your focus was elsewhere whereas you know for a guy like Spencer you know he I felt pretty good where he was as far as understanding our system and knowing what to do. So we, we spent a lot of time on game management and talking about, you know, just manning his, managing his emotions and the, the different ebbs and flows of the college game and, and uh, you know, tried to prepare him mentally as much as you can. I mean, nothing's like being in the fire, uh, but it just changed the preparation uh, of what we needed to do to get him ready to play. But it was, uh, I was fun and I was, I mean, I, I you knew the whole, it felt like here the whole time he was going to play well, um, that it was just, it was inevitable. And uh, so, and he did that. So before I let you go, I, I've always wanted to ask you this. Let's say one of your assistants brings you my huddle tape or I'm, I'm a QB at your camp. How do I get an offer to play QB for the Oklahoma Sooners? Ooh, you want me to what be What are you not- looking for? You want me to be nice? You want me to be real? Uh, not let's, let's pretend I could actually play quarterback. Let's, uh, yeah, I, I know I need to lose a little weight and, and mobility is <laughs> an issue. Arm strength's an issue. Decision-making is horrible. We got all that, but yes, right. let's imagine I'm a good high school quarterback. Yeah. And yeah. what, what, is, what, what does a good high school quarterback have to do to make Lincoln Riley go? Yep. Okay. I'm off for that guy. You know, honestly, for me, it's, it's kind of two things. I mean, I think individually, you know, I think I've, I've got to feel like you're a guy that could help us win a national championship. I mean, that is a national championship caliber quarterback, um, or not individually, just collectively as a group, as a leader. Um, you know, I love guys that have already been successful um, and, and have that edge about them, that competitiveness that you feel like they can be that guy. And then I, I think individually, I mean, you know, we're looking for somebody that we think is capable of winning a Heisman Trophy. I mean, that's, it's a high standard. I mean, it is. I mean, you, you feel like we can equip guys here to accomplish a lot of things. Um, now, does that mean every guy's going to win it? No. Is that is a guy winning a Heisman Trophy a goal of ours? No, it's not. Um, but you want guys that if we do our job and surround them with the pieces we can, um, if we do our job in developing them and putting them in great situations schematically that can achieve the very top of what you can in this game first as a team and second as an individual. So that's, um, that's high standards, you know, but the good thing is it eliminates a lot of guys pretty quickly and and allows you to focus in on the guys you really believe in. Well, I'm going to go throw in the backyard and I'll I'll be ready (laughs) when I, when I, when, when when you're allowed to have camps again, I'll hit your camp up and, and, and I'll, I'll show them. I'll, I'll show you. I can, I can do the, the Heisman thing. So I'm ready. I'm ready for it. Let's do it. 
All right. Lincoln Riley, thank you so much. You got it, Andy. Thanks for having me.